Hi, everyone. Welcome to Community Conversations. My name is Courtney Shaw. I'm the facilitator of our lecture series. And we have with us today Trey Beatty, who's an anthropology instructor here at LCC. Before I introduce him, I do have a couple of announcements. One is that next week, Anita Cork will be talking on Injustice for All, really. And we also have an activity if you'd like to take part in the chat. I have posted a link to a Google form where you can take a survey about how we determine race. So feel free to pop in and visit that. And uh, I, I took it recently, it was very interesting. So uh, feel free to do that as well. Our speaker today, originally from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, Trey received his bachelor's degree in anthropology with a focus on forensic anthropology from Louisiana State University, go Tigers. He began teaching in graduate school, also a time when his research interest drifted to bioarchaeology, which looked to interpret past human behavior from skeletal remains. He's worked on archeological projects in the American South and Midwest, in Northwest Mexico and in the Middle East. While living in Oregon, he worked with heritage specialists, other archeologists and the general public on the preservation of historic cemeteries. In 2015, Trey joined LCC's social science faculty as an instructor of anthropology and sociology, where he challenges students to look beyond the familiar and see themselves within the broader social and cultural context to which they belong. And we are very lucky to have him. So please welcome Trey Beatty. Okay, thank you, Courtney, for that great introduction. Um, so happy for, for all of you that are, that are joining today. Really happy to be presenting to you on um, a topic that I think is really fascinating um, from just sort of the, the biological aspect of it in terms of how we understand human variation, but also from the social and cultural aspect of it in terms of um, how sort of that, that, that intersection um, between sort of uh, per perceptions and and sort of how we create our worldviews and how we perceive the world and how that intersects with things like how we understand biology as well. So um, what I'm going to present today is um, is a little bit of sort of like a, maybe a, a, a session that you might get in one of my uh, my intro to biological anthropology classes when we talk about race. Um, and maybe in this presentation, since it's geared for a little bit more general public, I'm, I'm also exploring uh, a little bit more of um, some historical components of how the discipline of anthropology um, it, it itself was sort of involved in uh, not only the the sort of creation of the concept of race that we typically uh, have today, and when I say we, I mean just sort of the, the general Western uh, concept of race, um, and then sort of how, you know, in some ways anthropology perpetuated that uh, idea, and then maybe sort of kind of ending off looking at ways um, that anthropology has worked to uh, dismantle um, some of that early work uh, and to dispel the, that concept of race. So I'm just going to start off here um, with, uh, this is just a quote taken from uh, a, a biological anthropology textbook, but it's one, um, it's a textbook that was published by um, Certainly, I think uh, maybe a biological anthropologist that uh, over time has tended to have um, heterodox views from maybe the the general uh, sort of whatever the current kind of paradigms within biological anthropology were, um, just sort of forward thinking. His name's Jonathan Marks, and in fact, the, the title of his uh, biological uh, anthropology textbook is The Alternative Introduction to Biological Anthropology. So he sort of approaches things from a little bit of a uh, contrarian heterodox uh, approach. But he um, has this to say, the study of human diversity involves a negotiation between observed patterns of difference and subjective perceptions of otherness. And 
I, I really liked that that particular quote because I think it sort of captures um, one of the things, sort of the the underlying theme here, and it's something that that I hope that you'll sort of keep in the back of your mind and maybe you know sort of reflect on by the time this is all said and done. So um, just to maybe start off, uh, it's always good to maybe uh, define or at least maybe try to define uh, the terms. So, um, you know, this is a simple question, right? What is race? I think we slam dunk. We all sort of have an idea in our head about what, what race is. Um, but in reality, the, the, the concept itself um, is is very ambiguous um, and and quite quite slippery to to sort of nail down. Um, so this is, you know, it's always kind of good to get that uh, dictionary uh, take on on a particular term. So this is the Oxford English Dictionary recent version. Uh, race defined as one or more of the following. So. Um, I don't feel like I necessarily need to read all of these, but uh, as you read them, you can see maybe some, some similarities, right? So maybe the first one, a major division of human species, of the human species based on particular physical characteristics. Um, so so that, that first bullet is maybe one of the ones that is maybe the most straightforward working definition of, of sort of what we kind of think of race as our, as a concept as it developed over time. But um, over time, it's become more nuanced and there have been sort of different takes on what that means. And you guys can see some of those here. And just to highlight another one that maybe strays a little bit from um, specifically looking at physical traits, uh, what anthropologists would call phenotypic traits. So those are those are expressions of our genetic makeup, right? That would be the phenotype. Um, but if you look down to that, you know, it's like the third to the last uh, bullet there, a group of people sharing the same culture and language. Um, that's remarkably different from a lot of these other definitions that have to do more with physical traits. Right. So um, we can just see here that the, the very definition of this term that is widely used and, and, and has such, um, such, such social uh, impact and power in our lives, um, it's not necessarily well defined, uh, quite ambiguous. So um, that's just something I, don't, I wanted to put out there to, to begin with. So um, what I want to do is, is kind of walk through um, a little bit of a historical tour of how the concept of race developed. Um, and just sort of as a spoiler um, to kind of what what we're moving towards here um, is that our modern concept of race is sort of the way we generally think of it today is relatively new. Um, and when I say relatively new, I mean, um, it sort of uh, starts to appear in the modern era. So, you know, probably in the last 500 years and over that time, it has you know, it become it started becoming more frequently used, um, and it starts being used in uh, European languages with more frequency, um, and uh, especially within the last um, uh, during the 18th and, and 19th centuries, uh, really sort of you know kind of rose to prominence with sort of the rise of scientific racism and and. and the the racialization of science and, and and some of those things so we'll sort of get to those points but i want to kind of walk us through maybe i mean it, it's sort of obvious not all people look the same right we can see that people look differently in in our physical appearance um 
and people have always always recognized that, right? Um, but what did people think about human variation before the modern era? So sort of like how did people conceptualize those differences between between people? Um, so and and I, I wanted to yeah, I'm not gonna go too much into um, too much into this here because I think um, in some communications with Mike Strayer, I think he might be touching on some of these things a little bit later on, like in a few weeks in his talk. Um, but it, you know, when we think about the human brain, the human brain is very well adapted for things like pattern rec pattern recognition and um, categorization. And it's not, it's not necessarily a stretch to, to sort of imagine that the human brain as it evolved, there likely were some adaptive advantages to, you know, whenever human beings are living in small bands, um, to being able to recognize when you maybe see individuals from another group they're not in our group. May, may, might they be dangerous, right? Uh, is there something to, to worry about there, right? So, so just like that idea that we pick up on patterns and we recognize difference and we categorize things, that's something that might be sort of like a, you know, kind of a, a, a something that appears deep in our evolutionary past. All right, so um, I'm going to move on from that because I think Mike might, again, touch on that a little bit later. But I want to get just sort of to the idea of how do people sort of tend to think about human difference in terms of physical appearance uh, prior to the modern era. And largely when we sort of look at some of the earliest historical documentation, it seems that by and large, differences in, in physical appearance were largely interpreted in um, local terms. And, 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 and that's to say that, um, you know, whenever you're living in an area, right, and maybe you have some, you know, your particular society, maybe a small village or, or even uh, a larger urban center in prehistory, early history, You've got individuals that are involved in maybe trade, commerce, and those individuals are coming into contact with other people that are also engaged in trade, commerce, um, from maybe areas farther away from maybe that village or that urban center. And so those individuals always had, you know, were coming into contact with people that maybe didn't look exactly quite like they did. But um, again, those, those changes or those differences were relatively subtle. Um, and, and we'll sort of revisit this um, in, in just a moment, just sort of thinking about the difference in traveling over land and sort of, um, you know, down the road coming into contact with another group uh, that maybe looks a little bit different from yours and then you kind of keep on moving from them and you come up, to, uh, you know, you meet another group, maybe they look a little bit different, but, but not that much different from the group that you just left from. So those, those changes that you might see and differences in appearance are, are more subtle than maybe what you might get whenever, as we see here, here, here in a moment, um, things like long distance sea travel. Right, so um, so this is just an image. This was um, it's a, a copy of an image uh, from the tomb of Seti the first. So this is New Kingdom Egypt, uh, probably around I want to say maybe um, early 13th century BCE. Um, and so these are depictions of different peoples that that the ancient Egyptians would have been having contact with. So we have uh, from left to right a Berber. So that's, uh, you know, sort of the modern uh, area of Libya. 
um, a Nubian. So that's uh, that was the uh, the term for the the geographic area south of Egypt. Um, so uh, like what we would think of Sudan today. Um, and then an Asiatic, uh, so that's the, the Levant region, so that uh, area of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, right? So uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, um, Lebanon's, you know, Syria, sort of that, that coastal area, uh, and then an Egyptian, right? So it's clear that, that even at that time, they're representing in their, their Part, uh, those those physical differences, right? So so people are recognizing those differences, um, and you know this is this is one of the things that um, uh, I've got some resources at the end of the the show that that I share, um, and uh, one of them is the the book The Mismeasure of Man uh, by Stephen Jay Gould. Excellent excellent book. I, I highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in this, but. Um, Gould has a really interesting quote here, and it kind of relates to this idea of kind of these earlier ways that we, we tended to look at human variation versus sort of as the, that concept of race developed more recently. And Gould says, racial prejudice may be as old as recorded human history, but its biological justification imposed the additional burden of intrinsic inferiority upon despised groups. And, and that's sort of um, one of the key components here is, is in the modern era, um, sort of that, that push of science um, largely sort of steeped in the idea of biological determinism really was um, the thing that sort of influenced this, this development of the race concept. Um, other ideas that, that were sort of influencing um, sort of kind of like the these early is, you know, not quite the modern race concept, but it's just sort of the, the general intellectual um, sort of atmosphere, right, of, of how people tended to think sort of the underlying ideas that sort of um, were, were there for people's worldviews. Certainly classical Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle um, played a large role in sort of influencing how people thought about these things for, you know, centuries. Uh, again, uh, even, you know, up through past the scientific revolution, these ideas still were sort of underlying, uh, they were kind of like the, uh, providing that framework for like the base assumptions that people were working with. Right, so these included things like essentialism, which was sort of the idea that um, there exists sort of these ideal types or what um, Plato called essences, right? Um, so sort of this idea that there may be ideal types of, of humans. And then the, the second one is just sort of this, um, sort of this idea of ordering the world around us. Right, and, and that's something that um, particularly Aristotle was highly influential in um, whenever he produced his, what was it called? Uh, was it the Scala Nature, sort of the ladder of nature, right? Um, and, and, and over the years, that was sort of morphed into what we typically refer to as the great chain of being, right? So that, that, that we can sort of logically order um, the, the both non-living and living world around us, right? So we kind of have this artistic representation here of, of the great chain of being, right? And, you know, you guys can sort of see, right, plants, right? Sort of, you know, quote unquote, lower forms of animals, right? And of course here we do have, you know, different types of, of people, right? And obviously, you know, this is, also mixed in with a lot of influence uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so here at the very top, we have uh, angels and God. So, you know, what, what does this look like? And we're kind of moving through history. Um, we're kind of setting the stage. Those are a lot of the ideas that are sort of, you know, providing some base assumptions. But that really, some things really start 
being shaken up um, in uh, obviously the, the late 1400s and, and the, the 1500s as well. So the European Age of Discovery really um, created an optical illusion for that human variation. Um, and again, we kind of put the, the Age of Discovery like in a broader context, right? So this is, you know, early 1500s. Um, I mean, you've got uh, other things. This is like the, the, you know, the scientific revolution is just getting started, right? You've got Magellan circumnavigating the globe. You have like anatomists like uh, Vesalius doing these like really ornate drawings and depictions of human anatomy. Um, I mean, you know, people's heads are exploding, like with all this not new knowledge that, that that's happening, and it's, it's sort of all kind of happening at this time, at the same time that European powers are spreading out all over the world, right, expanding, colonializing, um, colonializing, colonizing, I think that's the right word, um, and the, the, you know, what they're experiencing is something very different from what those ancient Egyptians were experiencing, right? So rather than traveling over land, right, and maybe noticing small differences, you know, from one group to the next as, as you move sort of, you know, bit by bit over land, now you have these instances where, for example, you have ships li leaving you know, England, Spain, and then arriving, you know, thousands of miles away on a completely different continent, um, you know, and now seeing people that are physically and also socially, culturally so much different from what, you know, their worldview, their experience, um, you know, you've removed sort of any, any of that variation in between. Right. Um, and, and so like the experience that they're having is is radically different from sort of those those prior experiences and, and sort of that, you know, prompt sort of that that, um, you know, I guess, you know, uh, need that want to sort of explain and define the other. Right. And, and again, this is, you know, we kind of see this kind of gl slow, gradual build um, in the in 1740. Right, we have Linnaeus, uh, Carl von Linné, um, and he was one of the earliest to scientifically classify humans. Uh, he um, did this in an update to his Systema Naturae, um, and he did this largely based on skin color, uh, white, black, red, yellow, and also uh, sort of major continental land masses. And, and he wasn't necessarily the, the earliest. There were some, some examples in the, the late 1600s um, where individuals were sort of uh, in some ways kind of separating or con conceptualizing of humans existing kind of in these defined groups. But Linnaeus was really the first to um, sort of go about this in the same scientific way that he was classifying other other types of living things, right, um, and and publish it as well, and sort of this is becoming, you know, kind of uh, uh, more well known and part of sort of the 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 larger intellectual sphere, um, and and it's interesting that you know we sort of start to see how it's really difficult to decouple what sort of these these early thinkers um, were sort of devising in, in terms of sort of how they saw the world with you really can't decouple that from the social historical cultural context in which they were living right um, and and these are just really I mean I remember the first time I, I read some of some of these um, it, you know, at first sort of blown away, but but then again, sort of like putting it in context, um, it, it tends to make more sense, right? So here are Linnaeus's uh, type. So he had uh, Homo 
Europaeus, Homo afar, Homo americanus, and Homo asiaticus. And in later editions of his classification, he attached behavioral traits uh, to these, uh, to these different groups, right? And not surprising, Homo europaeus, you know, white, sanguine, muscular, hair flowing, long blue eyes, gentle, acute, inventive, right? Governed by laws. Um, and you can sort of, you know, it, it drastically contrasts with the descriptions of, of the, the other groups, right? And, and so this is sort of, you know, it, this is starting to pick up steam. Right, so you have sort of these early naturalists, you know, natural philosophers, you know, coming out of, of maybe that first century or, or you know, 150 years after the scientific revolution is starting to get going, um, and just sort of is constantly building um, on itself. Uh, so not that long after Linnaeus was doing his work and, and building on his work. The German physician and naturalist Johann Blumenbach, uh, who is sometimes, you know, credited as being sort of the, the father of anthropology, um, created a racial typology uh, based on skull morphology. Uh, and these were, uh, according to Blumenbach, uh, his five racial types. So he had a Malayan type that included Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia Pacific Islands, the American type included Native Americans, Caucasian, Mongolian, so this was East and some Central Asian populations, and then Ethiopian type, which was Sub-Saharan Africans. So, you know, that's, that's happening sort of in the, the late 1700s. We get into the 1800s and um, like all this is providing sort of the the scientific basis or, or sort of the rationale for intellectual debates that are just you know raging um you know and, and these are debates that are going on um you know heated debates among intellectuals both in the u.s uh, in, in Europe, across, you know, between uh, U.S. and Europe intellectuals, European intellectuals, um, so much so to where, you know, there are uh, lively debates on whether or not humans are actually even the same species, um, or maybe the different races represent different human species. And, and this is sort of uh, a lot of times referred to as the debate between monogeny the idea that humans are all the same species or polygyny, um, and which sounds a lot like polygyny, but it's spelled differently. Um, so uh, uh, that, that humans were um, actually represented, uh, re that humans represent, the different human races represented different species. And, and you had intellectuals sort of on both sides of these debates. Um, and, you know, you can sort of see in the image here like how sort of the 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 ideas about otherness that had been developing you know since European expansion um, were were being sort of baked into um, the assumptions sort of the frame the very framework that these natural philosophers, sort of, you know, kind of on the, on the brink of sort of, you know, emerging professional science, um, you know, those ideas were sort of baked into their, their assumptions, right? And, and so we really can't take them out of that social, cultural, historical context. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, it's sort of, um, you know, like these debates were, they, they went on again into the late 1800s, like these debates uh, served as sort of the, the rationale backdrop for arguments uh, for and against uh, slavery in the U.S., for example. Um, and it's, it's really interesting that even, even uh, proponents of um, monogeny that argued that humans were all the same species and even um, were advocates for abolition, 
still didn't necessarily see the races as equal. Um, you know, they, they almost saw different racial groups as, um, you know, they would talk about them as in, um, you know, if, if given the, the, the tools and, and, uh, you know, the, the right surroundings and enough time, they would become more white, right? So, so, it, and I just had a, a really interesting, um, I just wanted to share one, oh, where is it? Yeah, this is a, a really interesting quote by Charles Darwin, right? So Charles Darwin was a, he subscribed, subscribed to monogeny and he was a staunch abolition, abolitionist and, and argued for the abolition, abolition of American slaves. Um, but he said this, so he wrote in The Descent of Man, so this is maybe not quite as famous as The Origin of the Species, so he wrote this in 1871. Um, all right, the break will then be rendered wider for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as at present between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla, right? So. Even then, those individuals that um, that you know weren't sort of actively using the the science, you know, to perpetuate and advocate for slavery, um, they still didn't necessarily see uh, uh, all quote unquote races as equal. Um, okay, so again, kind of moving forward in time, um, this is in, in the 19th century in particular, and, and also into the, the early 20th century, this is where you really sort of get kind of like, you know, like the hyper, uh, hyper science, like uh, approach to race, right? And this this probably is most uh, readily apparent in um, the field of craniometry. And also, uh, again, slightly later, you know, sort of in the early 20th century, the, the eugenics movement. Um, one particular individual uh, deserves mention. Uh, and that's um, in the United States, there was a Philadelphia physician um, named Samuel G. Morton. And um, from the, it was about 1820s to about 1840s, he amassed a gigantic collection of human skulls um, from different races, um, you know, uh, he was really interested in Native American skulls, um, but his goal in, in amassing this collection was he was trying to confirm that there was a difference in the size of the brain among different races. And then that, that then, um, provided the the basis and the rationale for ranking racial groups as some being superior, others being inferior. Um, and so you can sort of see here again in in this drawing. So this is a drawing that that Morton actually produced, right? So and you can see the the caption there, the the profile of Negro European, and Oran Utan. Um, so, and you can just sort of see like everything, like all the depictions of non white races, um, like features are exaggerated, right? To make these groups look less human um, and more like uh, our non human great ape relatives, right? And actually I'm gonna uh, uh, maybe make a, a, another comment a little bit later on, 
about the, the Morton collection, which actually still exists. Uh, this is a, a large collection that uh, is curated at um, University of Pennsylvania. So um, again, this is, you know, sort of perpetuating throughout the, the uh, 1800s into the early and mid 20th century uh, in the form of, uh, again, things like craniometry and uh, anthropometry. So just like taking all these different phys physical measurements of uh, the, uh, the body. Um, I mean, there are official offices. So there's the eugenics Ref record office in New York um, that actively was promoting um, this, this movement to, quote unquote, improve the population by things like selective breeding. Um, and, you know, I mean, like, we could do an entire segment on the eugenics movement, right? Um, but I just want to mention it here, just because it does have this tie to the work of, you know, these early, uh, early natural philosophers. And then, you know, once we get into the later part of the 1800s and early 1900s, by that time, the actual field of anthropology was, was that was around the time it was sort of becoming kind of a, a, a cohesive discipline, right? Um, Oh, and, and just another thing before I, you know, I don't have to go back to the next slide, but, um, you know, another area where that was being applied was uh, in a field that was developed um, specifically, uh, it was developed by a, an Italian anthropologist, and he called it criminal anthropology. I mean, this was really like this idea that that you could look at someone's physical characteristics, maybe incorporate also measurements from anthropometry, um, and basically, you know, predict or say that person is or is not a criminal. Um, some some pretty wild stuff. Um, so now we move into the 20th century, and in particular, we sort of move. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some some things that happened in the early 20th, early, early 20th century, and then uh, really a lot of this kind of picks up steam uh, after World War II. Um, but certainly one name to mention here in terms of anthropology is, is the anthropologist Franz Boas. And, um, you know, Franz Boas, anyone that's maybe taken an intro to anthropology class, a lot of times he's referred to as maybe the father of American anthropology. He introduced a lot of concepts. They're sort of staples in um, the way anthropology is um, practiced uh, in North America in general. So, you know, like this idea that we have anthropology in these different subfields and a focus on field work and participant observation, all those things, Boaz had a big, big impact on that early on. But one of the areas where um, he made a significant impact uh, early was in this question of race. And, um, he was an early opponent of the concept as it was, as it had been applied in the past and was at that time still being currently applied to humans. And he challenged sort of that idea that humans could be sort of separated into these discrete non-overlapping um, races, right? And one of the things that he looked at was another feature that all throughout the 1800s and that, that big boom in craniometry uh, had been used to support the race concept. And, and that had to do with the shape of the head. So in particular, it was a measure called the cranial index or sometimes it's referred to as the cephalic index. And basically it just boils down the head shape to one number. It's a ratio of, uh, I, I just wanna make sure I got it, yeah. Uh, the maximum width of the head to the maximum length of the head. And um, so, you know, in the past, the craniometry work in the past, so there were sort of these two general terms that have been, that have been developed based on that index. Uh, you essentially had uh, long-headed or 
uh, cephalic individuals or short headed or um, brachiocephalic uh, individuals. And one of the things that Boaz was interested in was like looking at, uh, okay, this idea that, well, is something like the cranial index static it, or is, is, can that, is that something that varies over time, right? And so what he did was he had a huge sample of over 1,800 immigrant families. So this was in the United States. He looked at the uh, cranial index of parents that had been born in Europe and the adult children of those individuals that had been born in the U.S. And what he found was that cranial shape was incredibly plastic. Um, he found that there were no sort of significant uh, correlates in terms of race and cephalic index or that cranial index. Um, and so based on his work, he argued that look, this, these ideas, this, this concept of race, right, these groups that we call races, they're not static, they change over time, and they're, they're susceptible to other, other types of, you know, the, the way other aspects of adaptation work, right, so influences of things like the environment, right, nutrition, development, growth, all those things, and so based on his research, and so this was uh, I think the, maybe the first thing he published was like 1899, and he, he published another work on this in, I want to say maybe 1910, 1911, but his main argument was that race didn't seem to be a biologically valid concept. And so, you know, while we sort of have to think of like the work now that some of these anthropologists are doing in the early, mid 20th century, it's happening at a time that the very concept of race has already become reified, right? It's like the idea of an abstract concept of race has now already become a very real thing. Um, and so much so to where it has influenced the very ideologies that individuals had and it under it sort of provided or was part of that foundation for the worldviews that people had right and and so you know this was this was sort of a, a slow process and and one of the things that we see is that among cultural anthropologists and also physical anthropologists working in this time, you start to see more and more individuals start to push back against this idea of race and sort of, you know, classifying humans um, into these racial categories, while at the same time in a, in a kind of specialization of physical anthropology that was starting to it was just beginning in, in sort of the mid-century after World War II, which is forensic anthropology. That is, is a specialization where the, the idea of race and estimating race, particularly for positive identification purposes for law enforcement agencies, that was really starting to get going as well. So you had these sort of two anthropology was going in kind of two different directions, right? You had anthropologists that were kind of broadly looking at uh, human variation, right, from a biological anthropology standpoint, and they were amassing more and more evidence that race really didn't seem to be a biological, biologically valid concept, and, and cultural anthropologists were also noticing that, you know, the very idea of race and how people interpret phenotypic variation, that's not constant across human groups. So there were like all these things that were sort of starting to undercut that idea while at the same time you had a very specific specialization within the field that was almost by what they were being asked to do, um, still using that that paradigm. It's, it's really interesting. So um, I'm going to just keep going here, maybe, a, I don't want to, uh, I don't know, how do I always lose so much time? 
Um, in, the, uh, in the early 1960s, uh, a very famous uh, anthropologist uh, that did a lot of work in helping us understand the, uh, the correlation between sickle cell, the sickle cell trait, and uh, the distribution of the malarial parasite. Frank Livingstone uh, also wrote that there are no races, there are only clines. And um, what a cline is, if you look at, you know, um, physical anthropology and looking at human variation, oftentimes you'll see a reference reference to clinal variation. And, and what that means is that whenever you look at most characteristics, whether we're talking about uh, at the genetic level or as things are expressed in the phenotype, you tend to see across geographic space gradual change along a continuum, right? And here are just a couple of examples. Over on the left, you see the clinal distribution of the B allele. So that's one of the genetic variants in the ABO blood system. So you can see how the distribution of that allele changes as you move across distance across Eurasia. And then over on the right, you see the clinal distribution of skin pigment, right? So um, we're, we're starting to kind of, again, build this, this mass of evidence that really kind of causes us to question some of those, those core ideas about the race concept. And again, this kind of gets us to looking at, you know, why is that the case? You know, what, what is the reason why we see these patterns of, of human variation, sort of this, this clinal variation. And part of the reason for that is that most of the traits that we see physically um, are, are observed, what we would say that they're observed continuously rather than discontinuously or as either being present or absent. So this is a, um, a slide here. So what we have is a graph of light reflectance or skin reflectance. So, um, the lighter the skin um, or less pigment that you have, the more light that's going to be reflected. So you have higher light reflectance or skin reflectance. And then darker skin tones have less or lower levels of skin reflectance because the darker skin, the, 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 those darker types of melanin absorb more of the visible light spectrum, right? Now, if we were just looking, and again, this kind of gets back to that idea of you know, probably what those European explorers were, were feeling, right? They, they were no longer just seeing kind of slow, small differences, you know, from one group down the road to the other, but rather they're seeing these marked differences from one population to the next. So we're looking at uh, the range of skin reflectance. We've got a Chopi, a Jirel, and a, a, someone from the Netherlands, right? And here's what those individuals look like. Okay, now, if that's all we had to go on, it might be very easy to be like, wow, that's very like distinct, right? We have very dark skin tones, sort of skin tones sort of in the middle and then very light skin tones, right? And, and so it's kind of easy to separate these out into different groups. But what happens whenever we start to add more and more human populations? Well, then it, it becomes much more difficult to to separate groups out, right? It, drawing those lines of saying, okay, this here's a group here, here's a group here, here's a group here, that largely becomes arbitrary, right? We can see here that the actual ranges in skin reflectance from all of those populations, they're continuously overlapping each other, right? And if you look at, if you sort of take a straight line and draw it through the, the sort of mode or the average um, uh, of that range, um, it just looks like a continuous curve, right? And, and again, that that kind of um, the reason why we see that type of variation is because again, most most of the the traits uh, that are expressed in our phenotype they're not coded for by like one specific gene. Um, they're coded for by multiple genes uh, that all sort of are kind of have an additive effect on the phenotype. And we, it's even more complex than that. We have, you know, uh, you can have, again, multiple genes kind of combining toward one phenotypic effect. You could have, you know, one gene with multiple phenotypic effects, right? And then, and then some genes are both 
uh, they're both of those, right? You can have multiple genes contributing, but then each of those genes that are contributing to one trait could also be contributing to other traits as well, right? And that's not to even mention the fact that the way that inheritance works, these genes aren't inherited as suites of traits, right? They're inherited individually. It's what we would call non-concordant uh, inheritance. And then really like, you know, one of the, the death knells here of the race concept comes in the 1970s and it's been continually, continually shown since then. And that's the genetic data that show that overwhelmingly um, the, the highest degrees of, of genetic diversity come within populations. In other words, if we were to look at if we were to separate groups up into racial categories, we would see more genetic variability within a racial group as opposed to between racial groups, right? So human races, if, if we were using the, the variable of race to look at and try to understand the pattern of genetic variation that we see, race is only going to count to about 10, maybe 5%. Uh, of the genetic diversity, right? So again, um, just really sort of undercutting that. So one of the main takeaways here, um, and I'm gonna try to go a little bit more quickly. I've got a few more slides. The main takeaway um, is that, you know, and this is something that <laughs> Courtney, I think I've mentioned to you, right? It, for a long time, physical anthropology and anthropology in general has, you know, sort of, provided the evidence and shown that race as it developed as a concept, that this idea that humans exist in these discrete non-overlapping categories, that, that isn't real. That is not a real biological reality. Um, but that is not to say that race isn't real, right? Um, it's very much a real thing as a social construct and how it affects and impacts people's lives, right? And we see that, right? Even though the biological, even though biological races may not exist, right? The construction of that concept is very real and has real world impacts, right? If we look at things like median and average wealth by race, drastic difference, drastic difference between white and black. Um, we think education level might make a difference, it makes very little difference. You still see these huge disparities, right, between uh, black and white individuals. So we know that race has this, this really huge impact. Um, and again, kind of to just to, you know, bounce back to a point that I made before, you know, you have all this biological evidence that, that shows that race really does not ex uh, truly exist as a, a biological reality. And of course, there's, there's all the social and cultural uh, evidence that also backs up that this is really something that is a social and cultural construction, right? Different societies don't view human difference, particularly physical difference, the same way, right? It's, we sort of use the, the, the concept of hypodescent, or maybe some of you guys have heard of the one drop rule. That's what re really the, sort of the, the idea that developed in the US and also South Africa, right? But it, it, in, in other parts of the world, it's phenotypic difference isn't viewed the same way, right? For example, in Brazil, it's much more fluid, right? They have over 125 what are called tipos or types, right? And, and, and the way that they combine the different physical traits and characteristics um, is, is extremely complex, right? Um, today, it, it's really interesting, and, and I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't have more time to sort of go into this uh, more, but I really wanted to, to give that historical context. There's a, a growing contingent of young uh, sort of a new generation of biological anthropologists that are, you know, really kind of taking a, um, a again, sort of a, a strong um, 
I don't think combative is the right word, but but a strong stand about really trying to tackle the, the ways in which the concept of race still sort of kind of pervades different aspects of anthropology, in particular physical anthropology, specifically with forensic anthropology. Um, you know, forensic anthropologists still are, are asked to provide, even if it's not called race estimation, it will be called something like group affiliation or ancestry, right? But, but the same methods are being used, right? We're looking at measurements, we're looking at, at sort of macroscopic uh, features of the skeleton, all those things. Um, and, and, and again, we still can't get away from the idea that the very, that very practice, it feeds in and, and feeds off of all the biases that are already there within our society around this topic. Um, so I, I did, I've got just a couple minutes left. I, I've got a couple slides here and, and I know that a lot of times um, you, you guys might not have access to the actual slides. So um, the, the links, maybe you can't access, but that's why I included the, the full um, web addresses here. There's some great digital media resources here. Um, uh, race, uh, the, the first two, Are We So Different and Power and Evolu uh, of an Illusion. Great websites with a ton of interactive um, things that you can explore the history of, of race and sort of people's lived experience with race. The Biology of Skin Color is, is a really uh, great video. It's sort of about 17 minutes long. And it really gets into the, the genetics of uh, human skin color. Uh, and it's narrated by one of the anthropologists uh, that it, you know, has done a lot of, uh, of work in that area. Her name is Nina Jablonski. Um, Seen on the radio's uh, Seeing White uh, series. So I think that was season two of Seen on Radio. Um, excellent uh, and even covers some, some aspects of, of anthropology. A couple books, uh, again, The Mismeasure of Man, can't uh, recommend that enough. A um, couple chapters and some intro texts, but they're open resources, so freely available. Um, this book, Race in North America by Audrey and Brian Smedley, it's actually available online uh, through the library, excellent resource. And then a couple uh, professional statements on race um, as well. And, um, The last thing I want to do is, well, let's see, maybe I shouldn't have done that all the way. Um, I just wanted to look and share, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, share the screen, but I just wanted to look and see. So the um, average correct response on the, uh, the survey, we had uh, 11 folks uh, complete the survey. Uh, the average was uh, six out of 20. And it, it's really interesting. Uh, we just got like one minute left, but I went back uh, yesterday and looked at about um, uh, the last like several quarters of my students responding to that same survey, about 200 responses. And the, the modal number correct was like usually in between six or seven. So, and, and that just goes to show that You know, uh, our ideas about race, they're based on stereotypes that we learn, uh, but really it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of human variation. And I know I don't have a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any if someone has one. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm average. I got six out of it. So I'm very, very proud of myself. <laughs> average Nailed um, it. <laughs> I did, I did have one question I wanted to pass on, which is um, with all this discussion about sort of genetic diversity within racial groups, however you want to categorize that, um, what does that say about services like 23andMe or Ancestry that are supposed to tell you you are 16% Irish or something like that? What, what, how do they yeah, do that? I mean, you know, and, and that's interesting because, because I've, I've, uh, I've used one of those services before, right? And, and it was really more so um, because I was interested in sort of the Neanderthal piece of it, right? But, um, but you, 
whenever you're looking at your results from those services, um, you just have to be aware that, you know, those, those numbers that you get are probabilities, yeah. right? And, um, you know, if it says, you know, your X probability, let's say, you know, 60% probability, this ancestry of that, you know, whatever generation, but then there's still, you know, a big hunk of probability that it could be something else, right? So, I mean, that's, I would say just always keep that in mind uh, whenever you're, you're reading the results from any of those, those, those services. And also to keep in mind that, um, you know, in a, lo a lot of times the results are based on the databases that those services build themselves from other clients, right? So it's, it's a, you know, a, a specific sample, reference sample that they're drawing from. Um, and that actually leads into another question that we had, which is um, how does the uh, um, Homo sapien versus Neanderthal or De Desinovian work with that? Um, well, so you know, that's a really interesting question. The, um, you know, long story short, probably around 500,000 years ago, at least by about then, you've probably got a few different lineages of human that are starting to diverge. Now, they never really become isolated enough to become separate species because we know there was inbreeding between modern humans or among modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, because we still see their genetic signatures in some modern populations. Um, but, um, but, you know, over that time, you, you did have some divergence and, and some bits of isolation um, in, in those groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are at this point out of time, but I wanna thank uh, Trey for giving his talk and also for our audience members for uh, uh, participating in the survey, if you did that and, uh, and, and uh, um, joining us to get a little learning on during your lunchtime. Thank you very much, everybody. And please come back again next week. Thanks everyone.